Welcome to Vacation Station, hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. Sarah Elliston is back on Big Blend Radio today to share tips on how a family can plan a vacation together to make sure they get to the places and do the activities that mean the most to them without drama. You cannot well, have any drama. <laughs> the more people involved, the more chance for drama. I know. Well, That's Sarah sure. is the author of the book, Lessons from a Difficult Person, How to Deal with People Like Us. You can get it on Amazon or go to her website, sarahelliston.com. She's a faculty member of the William Glasser Institute, and she is a workshop leader and trainer who's certified in values, realization, parent effectiveness training, and reality therapy. And uh, again, her book's on Amazon, so go check that out. And also go to blendradioandtv.com. And she's one of our experts. You'll see her in our expert department. And if you click on Sarah, you'll see her articles, and you can also uh, listen to her past interviews with us. So welcome back, Sarah. How are you? I'm great. I'm glad to be back. Thanks. And we're going to talk about travel. Normally, we're talking about office gossip or how parents can actively listen to their children. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about you know how to decide on your vacation and plan a vacation and um, this is going to actually be featured in our Parks and Travel magazine. Normally, you're in our Big Blend Radio and TV magazine, but um, it'll be in our June-July issue of Parks and Travel magazine, and also uh, you can read the article now up on nationalparktraveling.com. Just type in Sarah Elliston in the search box. You'll find it there. So this whole thing on vacation, I know you were on a show with us, Sarah, um, not too long ago, and you were talking about decision-making, and this is where this idea, we're like, we need to talk about this for travel, because this whole idea of how to, it's a choice ladder, that's what you call it, right? On well, how to actually, make decisions. I think you called it a choice ladder. I I, um, I learned it as a planning board, but you laid it out in a square, but then when we talked about it, I, I said, well, you just lay them out in the line. Um mm -hmm. And so you said, oh, it's a ladder. So we call it a trace ladder. Oh, That's okay. fine. Whatever. It's it's a choosing tool. It's a prizing and cherishing tool um, from values clarification. Okay. And, as long uh, as there's no snakes on the ladder, I'm happy. No, no <laughs> snakes. <laughs> Ooh, where did you get I, that vision? That's just icky. Well, we live in the desert. We hang out with rattlesnakes. Uh, out here. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <Kill our> friends. <laughs> yeah, we see them quite, you know, quite frequently. So snakes are always on our mind every single day when we step out and walk Even about. On the ladders? And so, Why would? Well, never mind. Snakes and ladders, the game. Oh duh. <laughs> shoots and ladders. It's shoots and ladders, not oh, snakes. Oh well, you and know ladders. what? This is an English thing. It was snakes and ladders oh. when I was growing up, where where uh -huh. I was. So yeah, well, they Americanized it. Oh. So you go slide down it like a oh. uh, a water oh, shoot like or a laundry a... shoot. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, okay. <laughs> okay. Isn't that funny? That's not really why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've gone off on a good tangent. Okay, yes. so so we're going to use this to help plan a vacation, and this is something your family uh, used for going overseas. It is, I, as I said, it's a it's a choosing tool or prizing and cherishing tool that I learned in values clarification, and I found that it was very helpful um, when I was managing people and managing programs when we were trying to figure out what we really really cared about. We all had, you know, six or seven things we wanted to do, and and uh, so when my our son was thirteen, we figured. If we were ever going to travel uh, in Europe with him, we better do it then because he, once he hit 13 or 14, he was going to just sort of look at us and go, whatever, and mm -hmm. not really be <laughs> part of our family for a little while. So my my husband had been to Great Britain as a high school, uh, recent high school graduate, and he and his best friend had done this tour all summer long where they rode um, on the trains. They were had bicycles and they went from town to town visiting various relatives. My father-in-law grew up in Great Britain and so there's tons of Ellisons there. Mm -hmm. And I had met some of those relatives and so had our son, but not all of them. And my, my, my husband really wanted to do the same kind of trip. And so we, we were gonna rent bikes and we were going to bicycle around the various places and take the train. So you, 
because mm. in Great Britain, of course, the trains are very regular and as they are in Europe, um, you could you knew that you could catch a train and there would be a, a mail car where you could put your bicycle and they'd be safe and then you could ride for however long you needed to. And uh, then you hop off and ride your bike for a couple of hours and get to where you wanted to go. Ooh, and it nice. really was great. The difference was that he graduated from high school in like 1960, I think it was 1960. 59 or 60 and so there weren't as many cars on the road in Great Britain that was only you know 10 or 12 years after the World War II <laughs> and so there weren't as many cars on the road as there were back when uh, mm. this trip was in the 90s I guess or the 80s anyway it was it was interesting but what what we found was I spoke French and I taught French and I wanted to go to France mm. I, we had three weeks and I said well you know three weeks and you just hop on a the ferry and go over to France. It's not that hard. We just go over and spend the day riding around France and then come home at night. And my husband said, no, it's not that simple. And I'm not sure they had the European Union yet. So, you know, we had to have passports and all these things. Um, he said, it's, hmm. it's going to take a couple of days. Our son had heard about Oxford um, University. I don't know how he knew about it. He'd seen something on TV about it. But he absolutely wanted to go to Oxford. <laughs> well, it turned out that there was an Elliston relative who was um, like uh, the dean of Cambridge. And not, not, it's not the dean, but, but Cambridge has a variety of schools within it. And one of my husband's uncles was the dean of one of those colleges. And you know, they were offering us um, bed and breakfast, and <laughs> come and mm. visit. And then um, there were relatives that we knew who lived in Norfolk and um, mm. a wonderful woman that we, I got to know the summer I met my husband before we got married, who lived on the Isle of Man. And wow. of course we thought, well, Stonehenge is important and, and uh, we have to go to Stratford-on-Avon. You have to go see a play, right? And go visit all the Shakespeare's house and all that stuff so it got really contentious it wasn't outrageously dramatic but you know we started out having a cup of tea at four o'clock in the afternoon in the winter sometime in January when my husband said we really have to decide where we want to go so we can map it out and um, line up bed and breakfast and and you know that kind of thing and we were <laughs> I thought Oh dear, <laughs> this oh, is turning into an We've argument. Long yeah. Yes, and everybody wanted something different, and um, there were things that I didn't know I didn't want, or that I did what you know. My husband said, "Well, what if you know we've got to spend time in London because we could go see a play. We could, uh, we need to go to the the Tower of London. We need to go to the you know, um, uh, where the Universal Dateline. What I've forgotten what it's called. Where, um." Where time starts, you know, where they base the time oh, around the yeah, world. The international dateline. I think. Yeah, it's it's in London, or you know, it's a, yeah. a train ride from London anyway. And all these things were important. I was like, ah, I could care less about the dateline. You know, that's not important to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have. And oh, and then there was sailing on the Norfolk Broads, and and I Yay. could say, what? Cool. Yeah, well, I didn't even. I mean, what's a broad? And it turns out, the broads <laughs> are are um, not flooded. Women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like it's as if you know if, if if Europe and England were still stuck together before the continents split apart or the oceans came in and flooded them. Um it's like Holland in that it's it's flat and it has they're not canals really. I guess they're flooded um swamps or something, but they're not very deep, but there's lots of of rivers and uh mm. ponds and you can you can sail. They rent lots of uh uh houseboats but they also rent sailboats and we all love to sail so this was getting really tricky <laughs> and and I remember thinking oh my god we have to go sailing we're gonna have to buy food we're gonna, it's gonna be too much trouble so I said what if we did a planning board and both my husband and my son had participated in workshops where we did planning boards on things that we personally cared about like recreation or relationships or or mm. what you wanted most out of school or whatever. Um, but we'd never done this kind of thing. So I said, okay, let's list everything that we want. So we took one piece of paper, we listed all the things that we wanted to do, not who wanted to do it, but just all the items. And then we took a piece of paper and we tore it into 10 pieces. Mm -hmm. And 
we each separately lay, wrote down the thing that we wanted and we put it on, if you won't think of it as a ladder, we put it on the, like the top rung if it was the most important and maybe the fourth or fifth rung if it wasn't as important. And of course, what happens is you, at least from my experience, is I'd write down the thing that was the most important and put it at the top. And then I go and find the next one on the list that I think is important and write that down. But then sometimes it would move the thing on the top. So the rules mm -hmm. are when you do this kind of thing is that you can't have two items on the same rung and you can move them around as much as you want. But you should end up with 10 slips of paper, um, mm -hmm. the top being the most important and the bottom being um, the least it's still important, but it's less important. Okay, and so it is a letter, yeah. So the, yeah, yeah, so well, I learned it in a in a different format as, yeah. a, as a board, but this is this is the simplest way to explain it. <laughs> the fun part is when you, if you do this uh, on a regular basis, what what we we often do in in planning workshops is uh, to to get it laid out the way we think we absolutely like it, and then we number them on the back as to where we where they are. So you put a number one on the one that's on the back and you come back about a week later and you lay mm -hmm. them out again. And sometimes what was, was number one is no longer number one. <laughs> so I, I've done that with teams where I said, let's do this. Let's talk about it and let's go away and come back in a week and see if we are still of the same mind because you have to think about things sometimes to, to make these kinds of long-term decisions. But for our experience, what happened was, um, that the people came out important. I was stunned to find out that France just kept moving down the ladder because I oh, wanted wow. to see the aunt on the Isle of Man and I wanted to visit with the relatives in Norfolk who are then going to help us go sailing. And my son decided he really wanted to meet this uncle that was a Nobel Prize winner. Um, I think it was a Nobel Prize. Wow. Um, cool. It was a scientific, yeah, for, for science. Um, at Cambridge, you know, and and then <laughs> there were cousins uh, in London that we wanted to make sure we met, met up with because they had children our son's age. And what we didn't know, and this is my favorite part of the whole, not the whole summer, but one of the highlights of the trip was we walked to their house um, for dinner. And so mm -hmm. we we're walking down the sidewalk and we had arrived and there was a little girl swinging on the gate and Roly said, I, I think my husband said, I think this is the place. And I said, hi, my name's Sarah Elliston. What's yours? And she said, my name's Sarah Elliston, too. Oh, <laughs> that was so sweet. And so, of course, she's, you know, 40 now. But it was just so sweet. And so that was a fun part of it. But those, we didn't know them. My, my husband knew them, knew the, mm -hmm. the, the, the father, the husband of that family but we hadn't met the kids and we wanted to do that so what we discovered was as we after we had laid them all out we poured another cup of tea and then we looked at them and each one of us said this was on number one and this is why and this was on number two and this is why and the and the other others just listened so it wasn't mm -hmm. like well that's stupid you shouldn't have chosen that it was just complete um <laughs> this is your time tell us why you what you put and why and what we found was all of our highest ones, three or fours, they were all people. Oh, and wow. Oxford, Oxford wasn't even on my son's list. Wow. So it just so, it is about getting getting real and and you know seeing what what's truly you know impactful for you, and then you find out that you you all have something in common. It's just when you start throwing ideas out, I think this is what happens when you get a group of people together, whether it's an office, a community meeting, you know, a nonprofit, you know, family, friends, mm -hmm. you know, going on a vacation together, everybody starts throwing out ideas and it starts to get crazy. And, and then arguments start over one idea instead of looking at big picture. I think this really boils it down into a big picture, you know, um, and it's well, important it gives you a for budgeting. Yeah, it's a too. Very well budgeting. Yes, definitely. It would be. We did not do this for our budgeting, but it would have been wise if we had. I just left <laughs> all the decisions up to my husband because I hate money or no, I don't hate money. I just hate worrying about it, thinking about yeah. it. So I just said, well, you know, <laughs> tell me how much I can spend and I'll take care of that. I'll spend it. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely right. <laughs> that's, that's, exact, that's a talent. I know. That's, but I think this is really a really cool way of, you know, taking 
it, it puts the emotion in it in that you find out what your purpose is and you uh -huh. know what you're what you're passionate about like truly passionate about but it 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 takes it puts the emotion where it belongs let's put it that way well otherwise yeah, so you instead know, of when you yeah when you have an idea you put it forward you get attached to the idea because mm -hmm. it's yours yeah not mm -hmm. because it's the best idea when compared when everybody's comparing everybody's ideas mm -hmm. things should and will change but when you first start, you're like, oh, this is a good idea. This is what I want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's different. Yeah. Well, I found that doing that in planning um, with um, teams of, with my, in my case, they were uh, usually volunteers. Like we were going to have an event. And so mm -hmm. let's just brainstorm on all the things we think are neat. And um, also uh, the purpose, if you're doing, if you have like a nonprofit, is a mission statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it needs to, people need to revisit it. And so mm -hmm. doing a, a ladder on uh, why are we here anyway? Mm -hmm. You know, what are all the reasons that we're here and what are the top three? And what I have found consistently in that case is that there's a lot of agreement when people really take the time for something like that, you know, really take the time to think and chew and it, it can be a process. I mean, it's not something that happens quickly. We were able to do it in an afternoon because we knew how the process worked, right. and and it wasn't mm -hmm. it it was there was nothing threatening about it. Um, it okay. For people who have not uh, experienced being able to talk about what they really really care about and not be, get questioned about it, sometimes it's not as doesn't feel as safe. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. you have mm -hmm. to have that built in kind of is that whatever whatever you decide works now in in a large group um like more than three or four people i would probably um ask people to break into trios mm -hmm. um and just do go around the trio and what was your number one and why and what was your number one and why and what was your number one and why and then number two and number three and number four um and and emphasize the fact that you're merely talking about what you care about. You're not trying to change someone else's mind. Mm. And you know, and what, then, I think this is important too for tourism or entities when a community is looking at creating their identity or maintaining mm. their identity. Um, something we've seen as we travel that, and I'm just what I'm saying when you talk about groups. I think this is so important. You know, we talk. You are familiar with the eight keys of excellence. Mm -hmm. um, it panels that we you've been on a number of a couple of shows of that about that, mm -hmm. but we've also taken the eight keys of excellence and incorporated them into the eight keys of tourism excellence, and it's about how to build your community um, into a responsible tourism destination. So we're not talking spring break in Panama City. We're not talking <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing. We're talking about going and cycling with with trains and all of that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. the thing we've noticed is tourism's got a bad name where community members don't want travelers to come in because they think of the crazy tourist season. And it's because of the planning has been wrong and community leaders butting heads and not really talking to the, you know, the people that live there. Um, it's going to be, oh, I want to open this. So that's that. So when you were talking about this being on a group level, uh, mm -hmm. This really ties into the Tourism of Excellence series because it's about everybody having a vision and everybody having a say in what their community is. And I see this as a valuable tool. I was just trying to think how you would do it on a group. So you're saying break break them to, to um, you know, trios. trios. This would be excellent for a community meeting of, you know, creating a, a vision and building a community or fixing what's wrong or incorporating something new and good. Yeah, I think what um what has to underlie it is the is the the safety of no one's going to argue with you about mm. what you like. And mm. if you do it on a where you raise your hand and someone comes up to the microphone and talks about what they care about, then someone else gets up and <laughs> raises their hand and goes up and talks about it. It's it's um it starts to feel like a fight. Mm. An argument right. whereas when um we say okay let's let's list all the things that we think we could do and you can have more ladder and you can have more spaces than 10 it's just that if you could pick your top 10 then there's what i have found over and over again is that there's a lot of uh unanimity 
and and in this particular case it was all around people and i wouldn't be surprised if that wouldn't be true especially around tourism is that what what having uh spent i some time of my childhood in maine mm. um there are a lot of tourists that come in in the right. summer mm -hmm. and um the summer folk the worst part about it is the traffic uh -huh. you, know, you just you can't mm -hmm. really go into town um mm. except very early in the morning in the summer without having to put up with the traffic and the people who live there just know that it's just a that's the way it is because the the roads the, you you're not going to make the roads bigger so mm -hmm. that more people will come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, but, yeah, yeah. They, they're not. In, they they certainly want the tourists to come, but they're not interested in enlarging their roads to get more traffic because there's enough traffic. Thank you very much. And if people well, don't like the traffic, then they should come at a different time of year. Thank you for, for saying that. That's called the balance key of excellence. Yeah. <laughs> because every destination, even if it snowed over, Yellowstone National Park in the snow is apparently one of the most magical experiences. And everyone goes there in the summer. And we've experienced like Yosemite National Park mm -hmm. in the snow. And it was absolutely mind-blowing because it was so quiet, so still, and different yeah. animals came. I, it's, it's just a whole different experience. And that's mm -hmm. what we found, that, that whole thing about the traffic. And it's, again, because the communication isn't there and i think also people just like what you were talking about everyone has this idea when you're you know planning your vacation mm -hmm. going to england everyone has something that okay this is what i've always wanted and what i've always believed to be the truth right and that's mm -hmm. the same thing in tourism it's like hey we've always done it this way so we're not going to make a change and i think that's where this kind of you know way of communicating it instigates change in a in a positive way without it like you're saying it doesn't it it takes away that idea of argument and it allows people to have a place to speak that's a big big deal but there's there's also you know we've we've uh, done a lot of tourism seminars and especially in smaller towns where for some reason everybody just decides that tourism is only in the summer and there's huh. no reason for that. There's, you know, they can be a f all year round destination, but they only market summer. So they get overflowed in the summer. Everybody's miserable, and it doesn't, it doesn't work. When all well, you have you to live really in... do is rethink mm -hmm. your your strategy, or at least have one. Normally, they they actually don't have one, and the That's strategy the would be all year long. And then you get different kinds of people all year long and you don't get overcrowded and then everybody's happy. But switching somebody's mind over, as you know, can take a while. <laughs> well, that's why I was saying that um, with, with um, when we were like doing a work plan um, with um, mm. the, the advisory committee that I was working with for the program that I managed, uh, I, I would say, okay, let's do a, a planning ladder on this and let's talk about it and then let's wait a month come back next month and see where we are we'll we'll see if we have new ideas and we'll see if we have um you know if we want to just if we, if we don't have any new ideas then we'll see see how we lay them out this month and see if there's a change and often there's a change mm -hmm. because you think about things after you've talked about them and someone says well i chose x because it was something that was really important to my parents and the, the older i get the more i realize how valuable it is and i really think we need to preserve that and i may mm. have never given it any thought mm. now she's not trying to convince me and i've already chosen the things that i thought were important but if it was a less than a five i mean if it was a six or seven or eight i might move it up because i mm. respect this person and i hadn't given it any thought about do we need to preserve that or whatever? Mm -hmm. So, so giving people time in between doing the ladder and talking about it, and then actually making decisions based on it, mm -hmm. is helpful, especially when things are contentious. <laughs> How does it go from once you, you know, let's talk about it in the group setting too, because it, to me, I think that's where it, it's. You know, I, we look at the travel side for, you know, getting together as a family, you can have that dialogue in an easier fashion. But when it comes to the groups, which I think is just very vital, when when 
you've gone, everyone stood up and said, okay, this is my ladder. Everybody has their time to say, this is, this is my choices. This is why. And so everybody's, you know, hopefully taking notes of what they thought was important. What's the next step to see, okay, so what's the final decision between everybody? What's the next well, step? Well, um, you look for areas of agreement. Okay. So what do oh, we all have in our- a positive way again, right? And look oh, for agreement well, versus disagreement. Well, yeah, you don't get anywhere looking for disagreement. I mean, there's never been any yeah. help in that. But um, the you look for areas of agreement so that uh, if you say, okay, what let's let's list our top threes. So you make them. If you're using a whiteboard, you know, draw a line down, and on the other side of the whiteboard, you you say, okay, what were your top threes, and what were your top threes, and so then you list out, say. Uh, 10 items, um, and some of them have, uh, let's see, it, it, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but hmm. a slash mark next to how many chose this as in their okay. top mm -hmm. three, and how many chose this in their top three, and okay. so on. And you look for those things for people to agree on, because that's what's going to keep them working together. Hmm. And that's then, of course, someone has to decide that, Okay, so this is what I'm seeing. Now, it depends on how the organization is. I mean, if there's a budget issue, there that might this may be a number in the top 3, but it's going to be number 3 because we got to do 1 and 2 first hmm. in order to afford the third one. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I said because mm -hmm. a lot of times when when I see groups making decisions hmm. and and this is what's interesting. So I say you take a very positive like what do we agree on? What even okay, the TV show House Hunters. The first thing they do is, well, what do we oh. disagree on? That's the first thing they do instead of what I we know. agree on. I it's, know. The first, it's the negative thing first. Well, instead they need to create drama so that people will continue watching the show. But isn't that the problem? That's what we're breeding. We're breeding drama so we all start to live by drama. I don't disagree with you. I just, I don't disagree with you, but I, I, I always feel like when I'm watching something like that, I always think, Oh, they have to show us this, you know, somebody argues and, and it's always like yeah, nobody's happy yeah. if mama ain't happy. So, you know, the, mo the mother's going to win. So why are they wasting our time with this? And so I just changed the channel. <laughs> I know. I just want to look at the house and really, I don't want to hear about granite countertops ever again. I'm That's so it. Tired of that. <laughs> to me, try cement. It's really cool. You can do all kinds of things. But anyway. <laughs> and yes, they are. I find I, that was never a choice for me. I didn't even know it existed when I was redoing my yeah. kitchen. But I do yeah. enjoy seeing. I, the one I'm in love with is um, the DIY, not the HGTV, but the do-it-yourself network. There's a guy that re uh, rebuilds, repurposes brings back to life stone houses and, and stone cool. um, walls in Pennsylvania. And his show starts out with, uh, um, he'd been doing, he's been doing this for like 20 years or something. And he says, most of the houses um, were built before the revolution. Wow. <laughs> before wow, this country that is was incredible. even here. Yeah, That's it is, amazing. It is. But you know anyway. what? He on the travel yeah. side of this, so, you know, yeah, just so sorry. we can we can tie in our home and garden channel here um, <laughs> and do it yourself, is a lot of people do the vacation homes and things like that, and that this does require a decision making process. You know, do you even want to live in the place that you're looking at? Maybe are you going to retire? And all there's all these decisions that do have to happen. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's I just I really like the positive part because. You're looking at what you really like, and once you, it's it's like life, you know. And they say, hey, follow your passion, follow your purpose, find that purpose. You know, what what are you passionate about? And when you start working in what you're passionate about, you're going to do well. And when people are working in something they're not passionate about, that's when things start to happen that aren't so positive. So it's like, it's that breeding. And if they're living in or traveling, doing that because. When when it got to going to find the universal dateline, I I said that this is my day to sort of you know put my feet up and wash my hair and and sit in the sun in the garden outside the little bed and breakfast that we were at in great in in London and I don't want to get on another train and ride somewhere and and, and I I I will miss getting to see the international dateline and 
I'm sure it will be significant that I've missed it, but I'm going to miss it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we were in agreement on that. I wasn't being nasty. I was just saying, I don't want to go anywhere else now. I'm tired. This is weird. This was sort of towards the end of the trip. And mm. I was ready to just put my feet up and breathe, you know. Mm. And that's but, important to do in destinations. You know, that's one thing people yeah, forget. Yeah, we to forget to actually kind of live there for a bit and just to relax for a day, to take in the smells, the sounds, the birds mm -hmm. in the garden, you know, have tea. There's just a, you, we start to lose the excitement when we, we burn ourselves out when we travel. It's funny, like you come I, home and need a vacation. Yeah, you need a vacation. Uh, yeah, well, I, I find um, when I go to new places, I if I can't stay there for at least, a couple of days, I, I, like if I've gone to a community to to do a, a workshop or mm -hmm. to help facilitate something, and we're there for maybe three days, and we get there the night before, and we leave the night that we end, and we've only had early morning and late evening to kind of get to know the community, and of course we're usually planning or we're tired, and and um, I I don't I I don't like doing it much anymore because. It's fun to be with new people, but I want to sort of see how they live and, and eat what they are eating and walk around their streets during the day. And I don't always get to do that. So yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm not as good a traveler as I used to be. Well, but, you know, there's traveling, like if you're doing it from a work standpoint or vacation where you've planned so much that you can't even think. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. You, then, then you've kind of put yourself in a place that makes it not a happy, happy travel experience. If you're traveling for work, it's nice if you can arrange a couple of days before you have to do the work. Mm -hmm. So you know what kind of people you're mm -hmm. dealing with. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I like it. To me, there's something about entering a town when everyone's waking up, you know, when you see the lights go on and you just kind of, you know, what are they taking their kids to school? What does the school look like? And you get to know the community. That's part of travel. It's not about just seeing the landmarks. The landmarks are cool. You can see them on Google Maps and Earth and whatever <laughs> Google satellite. But and it's and I think it's important you go. You know, we're we're big. You know, we need to protect these places. Um, but there's something about the communities and going into in talking to the shop owners and talking to the people, you know, and, and on that note, we're going to have to set up a time, Sarah, for you to be on a show with Glenn Burroughs over who runs Norfolk tours in England. Cause yeah. I mean, he's been on our shows for years talking about yeah. Norfolk. And when you wrote about that in your article, I was like, Oh my gosh. And, and he, he had, when he first came on the show, he had to teach us what abroad was. And yeah. he said, now ladies, it's not one of you. <laughs> you know? But, um, He's the sweetest man, and, and I find it so fascinating about, you know, Elliston, the, the name Elliston and, and, you know, relatives over there, because that's his niche, is connecting people with their relatives, and mm -hmm. um, I know when we go back there at some point, which, you know, I would say yet at the end, because eventually one day, hopefully, we'll be everywhere, um, we lived in England for a couple of years, but I w and I wish we knew Glenn when we were there. Uh, but we're going to see if he can't, you know, trace some of our family history out there too. Because in That's the Isle good. of Man, we have the Isle of Man his uh, oh, family history. Oh, I'll too. tell you what, I would live there in a heartbeat. I'm really? sure it's not as lovely in the winter because it's pretty barren. Mm. But oh, it's uh, it reminded me of Nova Scotia, the the coast of Nova Scotia. It was. Mm windy and pretty and Ooh. and everybody was so nice um there we were there there were beaches but it wasn't you know people were not sitting on the beaches and enjoying them it was it was june i guess we we went in mid-june and stayed sort of till mid-july i remember they celebrated the fourth of july there which is to say they mm -hmm. didn't celebrate it but the people we stayed with <laughs> celebrated it for us because we were there <laughs> oh, that's sweet. That's funny. That's sweet. Uh, yeah. You know, and I love that. That's the thing about going into other countries uh, is to experience the hospitality makes us think about, do we do this in our country? When we lived in South Africa, and Nancy did the tour for, what, two, two and a half years? Yeah. We were on the road in South Africa, went to every single town, you know, every park, every, I mean, every, we did everything. And yeah. uh, when she was uh, raising money with her artwork, for the Can National Cancer Association out there. So we sometimes stayed in people's homes and um, we stayed in all kinds of places. And um, this one home, this Afrikaans family, actually made us a, uh, it was like a pumpkin pie, sweet sweet potato pie, because they're like, hey, today's Thanksgiving. 
And we're like, oh. it is. <laughs> and I didn't know it, you know, because you know, we were, we're not very traditional Americans because we, you know, most of our lives weren't here. You, you weren't but in they, America. <laughs> they, they went and yeah. tried to, their best to recreate a Thanksgiving meal. Or it, I don't even know if it was Thanksgiving, but they just thought that's what Americans eat. Yeah. And so they try to like, you know, here, we're going to take care of you. As, you know, here's a taste of America. And it, it completely wasn't. Now that I'm here, but I have to tell you, it was a really good pie. I remember that being one of the best pies I've ever had. But I thought, you know, that hospitality is something absolutely incredible. That South African mm. hospitality is mm. amazing. But your friends you're staying with, you know, well, let's celebrate Fourth of July. I think that is something cool. special. And and when you have those connections when you travel, those are those are delicious memories. You know. It well, really it are. turns out I I know my parents used to go skiing in Switzerland every year. And they they made friends that they went and saw every year, mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't stay with them, but they would you know visit them on their on their way or on their way home or, and and uh, I remember when my mother was um, older and my dad had died, she was still corresponding with two or three of the wives of those couples mm-hmm. that they had gotten to know when they went skiing, and it was I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> I I. That didn't I didn't have that experience. My older sister lived in Paris for two years, and she still corresponds with the children of the family. She was an au pair, and mm. uh, so she's still in in contact with the kids that she took care of. And I, I think, wow, hmm, That's hmm. Interesting. I wish I'd thought of doing that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So okay. So, in closing, on this, I want to know. Mm-hmm. If, if, you know, Priscilla, our pink sock monkey, she's a travel mascot, right? And okay. she she is rich beyond belief. So she <laughs> sends people on trips all the time and pays for them. And, we I mean, we keep asking her to do that for us. And then she's like, no, go clean your room. No, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, no, she's a great travel mascot. But um, if she said to you, hey, I'm going to send you away for a week anywhere in the world, all expenses paid for, where would you want to go? Oh my. Yeah. You know, my first thought was Thailand, but I'm not sure it's true. Um, my second thought was Bali. My husband mm. said I probably wouldn't like Southeast Asia because it the smells are so different. So <laughs> I wow. Um mm. I guess New Zealand probably. So now she's gonna put a list together. <laughs> Get going oh, you can hear me going through it. You know, the first yeah, thought was, yeah. I've, I've, Microsoft gives me pretty pictures every morning, and this morning it was a wonderful um, uh, uh, greenery and a, and a river in in Thailand. And I've, mm. I've friends who uh, my son has been to Thailand like three times. Oh wow! Um, just because he, he he finds it beautiful, and he they went there on their honeymoon for goodness sake. Um, oh. But. I think uh, my sister, my older sister, lived in New Zealand for uh, a number of years and worked there. And I have to say that it it does look like a really pretty place, and it looks like a country that um, I, I guess I admire the people in Australia and New Zealand because they have um, apologized for enslaving the indigenous peoples when they moved in. And we haven't done that in this country, and um, I've become less less and less proud of yeah, us. I agree. And <laughs> what have you talked to Kanye West lately? Oh, oh here we God. go. Don't don't start. Don't. We're not going to no, get into that. We're not going to get into that. But it's but, not just what, that. It just feels like New Zealand um, is more honest about itself than well, we that's are. the authenticity and, and integrity. Mm. You know, we talk about the integrity key of excellence, and we talk about that in tourism. Is mm-hmm. when the place has that authentic sense of place, they keep their values. And it mm-hmm. and it is about a community coming together and, and creating that. And I think it's it's interesting because we talk about that all the time. That you, as a destination or a place, a country, you know, a town, a city, that when people don't have integrity or integrity to the land and the people and the community, it does not. It's not attractive. Let's put it that way. Um, there's there's a place that we know that is an incredible birding destination, one of the top, and uh-huh. they promote this, and then they promote will come and kill the birds too. You can't uh-huh. do that. 
it's like one minute kill them one minute come and see them but basically we're saying we want your money either way instead of we want to protect the birds now come and kill them yeah i was going to say the the um tours i I, the 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 latter if you if you if you really use the you know allow the community to participate i think you can get away from some of the greed that uh seems to infuse so many decisions Mm -hmm. in our country right now it's sort of like what What's the bottom line? How much money will we make? That's really not, you know, the the deciding, at least that would not be my first choice for how do I make a decision uh, for Mm. how do we attract tourists? And that's what it sounds like they did it in in the place you're describing. And I I won't guess at the name of it, but but, there's um, a lot of them. You know, and and the the (laughs) reason that's when, when we do these things, this is why we keep saying the word sustainable, because what they're doing at the moment is not sustainable because as soon as the bird lovers find out about the other side of the coin they won't come back so that tourism is not sustainable that's that's just come and give me your money exactly and then yeah. and it actually so hurts the, it, the bird watchers it, because they get upset about it yeah. because they're they feel like they supported a community that don't that said they have these values but didn't follow through with it right so if if it's when you put the word sustainable this is something that you can make money off of for years to come, not just for the next six months to a year. And <laughs> and so the people in the room have got to be a mix of people, not all one kind of business owner. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it and it can't be, just be business owners right. or realtors or um, no, someone who's going to make a, a profit from whatever. The whole yeah. community needs to be able to, to profit from having visitors. Exactly. Uh, and and so everybody needs to be there. I know we my uh, we we re- did a uh, mission statement process for um, our church. I don't know, 15 years ago, and the person who did it um, used something similar to this, except they in small groups we drew pictures of the things mm. we found most important. There were like seven or eight people in a group and we spent a lot of time talking about what we found important and did a bunch of different voting things. It wasn't it wasn't like a, a ladder, but it was we were with the same ground rules in terms of we weren't arguing, we weren't trying to convince each other, we were just talking about what we found was important. And then mm. we ended up picking some some of the the top five, say, and we did a visual presentation to the rest mm. of the group about what we wanted. And it was mm. the thing that I loved about it was when they first I was on a team when they they said we want we want to buy the building next door for our youth. Mm-hmm. And um you work for United Way, so would you help us figure out how to raise that money? And I said, Well, to be honest, since I don't have kids in Sunday school you aren't going to get my money if that's how you come at me. What we need to do is, you know, there's planning process, which they eventually did, um, so that everybody in the room realizes that's what we need to do. Mm. And it took a year because they had to hire someone and they had to do all the different workshops. Um, but indeed, the the church was unified behind the idea of let's uh, raise money to buy that building so we can have a place for our Sunday school. And people like me who didn't have kids in it had participated in the planning process. And so we gave them money for it. I I like this, the visual side of it, I think, because mm. people, visuals are important. I mean, you, yeah. you look at how social media works. It works on visuals mm. and that people, you know, see something, they have an emotional connection with it. So they, yep. they, come to grips of their own decision faster, whether they like it or not. You know what I mean? They go, they have a response quicker. That's more pure. Um, it just, so long as the visuals are, you know, in, have integrity to what they're, what they're supposed <laughs> to re- represent, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying there, <laughs> everybody well, keep, well, be careful with those visuals. No, but I think this is a, a good, good thing for communities and travelers and, buying vacation homes or anything in life is, is these decisions because it's all connected. Um, I did want to ask you uh, one last thing here is, mm-hmm. you know, you wrote lessons from a difficult person. Yeah. Do you think travel helps difficult people <laughs> get past their difficulties? 
um, and in regards to um, improved communication if they speak to people and, and they don't travel like you know closed up you know if they travel and truly travel and communicate that it can help people become better communicators and not be labeled the difficult person uh, it depends on why they're being labeled difficult mm -hmm. um, every you know every, every it's, uh, some people are difficult because they talk to too many people and you can't get them to get back in the car and go to the next place mm -hmm. um, you know so so it's kind <laughs> of a tough kind of a tough question but but I think what you're asking is doesn't tourism or doesn't travel um, invite us to look at people and ourselves differently and the answer of course is yes mm -hmm. yeah so that if somebody is all closed up and and doesn't want to go anywhere or doesn't want those people coming to my town you know and then <laughs> then yeah if you can if you can hoodwink them somehow <laughs> into going somewhere else going you know get them to go somewhere thinking that they're, they're going for this reason and then oh my goodness mm. I'm sitting next to someone who speaks a different language but um, I should try to communicate with her then yes of course that will stretch my mind okay so that's sort of what you were asking isn't it yeah it's crossing boundaries yeah. getting out of our comfort zone yeah and yeah it's yeah. growth it's self-growth it's great um now everybody again Sarah's book is lessons from a difficult person <laughs> how to deal with people like us and she likes traveling so check yeah, that out. That's cool. interesting to hear about your travels and uh, and I, I love the the conversation of it. How families can you know everybody be incorporated on a trip, and I think that's important. And I think mm -hmm. it's important what you've talked about for tourism and communities getting together. I think that's super. Uh, just such a great avenue and a great tool for people to use. So everybody, uh, the vacation choice ladder article that Sarah wrote. I like this choice ladder. I'm mm -hmm. going to build a ladder I in like here. It. I know. I feel okay. like Nancy and I, we can do our editorial boards that way yeah. for the magazine. Sure. I know. Because um, nobody wants to know how that happens in this place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nobody wants to hear those discussions. I think this would be a good avenue for us, and Priscilla can, you know, build the board and, and swing on it um, on the ladder. But um, mm -hmm. it's up on nationalparktraveling.com. Just type in Sarah Ellison, you'll find. She's also got another article on there about uh, what makes a good volunteer. Uh, so yeah, we keep sneaking her over to the other uh, side of Big Blend. Uh, but if you go to blendradioandtv.com, uh, you will also see her articles and interviews there. But go to her website, sarahellison.com. Her books on Amazon. And uh, don't forget, Big Blend Radio is airs every day, Monday through Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Fridays and Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So six days out of week, not every day, but uh, you'll check it all out at bigblendradio.com. And we always like to play music for Sarah. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, your song of the day, are you ready? I'm ready. It it's called traveling. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> uh, it's from a friend of ours, uh, Wally Lauder. He's based here in Tucson, Arizona. We met him on our big road trip when we were in Silver City, New Mexico. Uh, he travels and plays, and uh, he's traveled around the world as well. Uh, and you can go to his website, everyone, wallylauder.com. That's L-A-W-D-E-R, wallylauder.com. And uh, here it is. So thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. You're welcome. Thanks so much for inviting me. I had a good time. Well, we always Take have care. fun with you. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Everybody, bye-bye. Here it is, traveling. Driving up the coast of California, oceans to the left, mountains Off the highway in between, stayed in a hotel for the night. Off a pier in Santa Barbara, there were dolphins swimming around. The sun was coming up over the mountains, the waves were making a rhythm. I'm traveling Finding my way Through this world we're in Flying on a plane to Africa The cabin was a colorful sight People speaking words 
I couldn't understand it was a world beat party seven miles high. Drinking funky tea with a bunch of guys outside a mud hut under African skies. Telling tales of the land I'm from across the sea in America. I'm traveling I'm finding my way Through this world we're in Die. 